Today on the Film & Whiskey Podcast, we will be interviewing world-famous podcaster, movie critic, and author, Josh Larson. Then we'll be breaking to try three new whiskeys. This is the Film & Whiskey Podcast. Hey, everybody. Welcome into the Film and Whiskey Podcast. I'm Bob Book. I'm Brad G. And we are coming at you with another special bonus episode. Bonus episode. Oh, I love the spooky voice, Brad. Mm, you're We're welcome. Try, trying to set the stage here a little bit. <laughs> For Scooby, Scooby-Doo Horror, Bob. Yes. That, that's about what I do. This is the episode where we finally do our top five Scooby-Doo episodes. <laughs> I, I get to talk about animated Sonny and Cher once Bob, again. Bob, can I, can I tell you something? Yeah. I have never watched an episode of Scooby-Doo. Oh my gosh, Brad. <laughs> you know, every now and well, then I'm reminded that you didn't have cable growing up, you know, and that's how I watched it because it was on reruns on mm-hmm. Cartoon Network all the time. So it makes sense. And yet it, it doesn't make any sense, Brad. <laughs> Josh, are you sticking with us here? Or is my lack of Scooby-Doo knowledge? I'm getting increasingly concerned. You start off with a lie about the world famous thing. Then then you, you know, mention your non-knowledge of Scooby-Doo, which is just a travesty. And, you know, I know I happen to know from a previous episode, both of you are skeptical about horror. So I'm getting kind of nervous here. I'm not, I'm not sure how this is going to go. Well, world, speaking of world famous, Josh Larson actually listens to our podcast. There wow. you go. He, he at least listened to one episode four years ago. And here's the <laughs> yes. thing, folks, uh, in true film and whiskey fashion, we are already off the rails. I was going to give our, our lovely guest today a lovely intro. And, you know, Brad has derailed us already, but we are joined today by someone who we will say is a world famous author and critic, Josh Larson, from one of my favorite podcasts in the world, Film Spotting. Josh, how are you today? I'm doing well, and and hello to all those Canadian listeners we have that make us world famous. I'm, I'm grateful for all of them. <laughs> Truly, crossing borders north and north. <laughs> Josh is here today to talk about his new book, which is called Fear Not, A Christian Appreciation of Horror. I have been looking forward to this book since you announced it on Twitter, I don't know, a year and a half ago, two years ago now, Josh. Yeah, I that remember, sounds, that's probably right. Yep. I remember you crowdsourcing uh, title suggestions, and uh, I think you landed on the best one here, man. This is just a, it, it's a fantastic book, but I, I love a good provocative title, and you hit the nail on the head here. Yeah, thank you. I mean, it was kind of right there um, for me with the project. You know, that's uh, that's a phrase of some sort that appears so many times in the Bible itself um, that uh, it seemed like it had to be part of the book in some way. So people responded to it as an option, figured why not just stick with it as the title. Josh is also senior producer at Think Christian, which is just an incredible site that does really deep analysis and and really thoughtful analysis of culture and film and music and thinking through things from a Christian perspective. And so it, it makes a lot of sense, the book that we have in front of us here today. Josh, right before we hit record, you were mentioning that, y- you know, you're, you're kind of on a, a press tour of sorts right now for the book, and you're talking to a lot of different audiences about the book, some of whom may not be Christian or may not even be interested in a Christian lens on horror And I'm wondering, you know, let's just kind of situate ourselves in your press tour right now. What are some of your favorite kind of insights that you've been gleaning and and, in having to pitch the book in some ways to all these different kinds of audiences? Yeah, it's interesting. So far, I would say the the responses have fallen in two categories. Uh, Some folks... uh, are immediately skeptical or there's disbelief. And these may be some outlets, radio stations or so forth, where um, there's already a posture of slight suspicion towards pop culture. And Mm -hmm. so they hear something like this and it's disbelief that Christians can have an appreciation of horror. They should even be watching horror. And so that's an interesting conversation to have. It's kind of like starting from ground zero, right? Um, And so those are fun to do. And then I will also hear from folks who are like, wow, I always knew there was a reason I resonated with horror so much. 
And it's nice to have that kind of put into words, put into spiritual terms. And uh, that makes a lot of sense to me. So that's kind of on the other end of the spectrum. And then, of course, there are people, you know, in between as well. And in general, what I've been saying about the book is it's obviously written, you know, primarily for a Christian audience to make that case for horror films from that perspective. But um, I love hearing from people and even getting reviews like on Amazon from folks who say, well, I don't, I'm not from a religious background, um, you know, wasn't raised in the church. Um, but this was interesting to me because I was looking at films through another person's lens. And I think we do that with all sorts of film criticism, right? If we're avid consumers of film criticism, um, you know, I, I love reading a specifically feminist take from from a staunch um, feminist who has credentials in that way of a movie like Barbie, let's say, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so I think this is just another version of that where you're getting a specific lens on film. And I've always enjoyed um, reading those from other folks my, myself. So hopefully this is that for some people in that way. Well, let's let's get one of the quick things out of the way. You know, in your introduction, you talk, you know, from the Christian perspective, probably the biggest objection you would get and the first objection you would get from a lot of Christians is the Philippians 4 passage, right? Anything that's true and honorable and just and pure and lovely, like, think about that stuff, Josh. What what are you doing thinking about all these horrific things? Yep, yep. It's so funny you say that because uh, just today on one of the videos um, on horror we posted at the Think Christian YouTube channel, I think that's where it was. We got that very same comment, right? Immediately, right? Yeah, yeah. So um, so you know it's going to come and I get it. Uh, I, I totally get the instinct. And, um, you know, there's, there's some logic to that. I think Christians are encouraged to focus on the beautiful and celebrate those things. That's, you know, one of the positive things about the faith, I think. But it's also a faith that is um, open to the reality of our situation in a broken world. So mm. it's not an either or. Um, and, you know, we could get into the context of the Apostle Paul writing to that particular church and his relationship with that church and how they weren't being chastised by him. I don't know if we want to do that on this podcast, but <laughs> the gist of it is, the gist of it is he wasn't, you know, reprimanding them for having watched, you know, the first century version of horror movies. <laughs> so it's a little bit different of a context. It was an encouragement to them. Um, and so I think that's helpful in at least thinking about the verse in relation to horror. And then, you know, beyond that, you could talk about, well, okay, but still, what is the value of horror for a person of faith, especially someone who wants to be a discerning viewer and is maybe you know, tries to avoid genres that are exploitative, which I'll fully admit the horror genre um, can be very exploitative, right? I get that perspective too. I really love uh, the introduction to this book. I was telling Brad uh, in, in a lot of ways, I have a few chapters highlighted, but I love the way you set the argument out in the intro. An argument might even not be the right word because this book is not called, you know, a Christian defense of horror or a Christian apologia <laughs> for horror. It's you you say very clearly up front, I think that Christians can and should partake of horror films because there are, in the best instances, redemptive elements to it. And Josh, I'll tell you honestly, my concern going into the book was I know exactly where this guy's gonna go. He's gonna try to argue that there is something uh, to be learned at the very least from even the most indefensible in the horror genre and things that I never want to see with my own two eyes. And it's like, I guess I can appreciate it, but I don't see the purpose of it. And what I found really refreshing, Josh, is that you don't try to do that. You're not trying to be comprehensive. And you say right up front uh, that the ones that you want to talk about in this book are the ones that you find a very uh, solid thread of redemption in. And I think that, honestly, I, I want to commend you for that because I think it helps make your argument a lot stronger and it helps guys like Brad and I, who are oftentimes on the fence with horror, uh, to buy in a little bit easier. Well, thanks. Yeah, it's interesting because, you know, the genesis, the very early genesis of, of this whole project is a post I wrote on Think Christian maybe seven, maybe eight years ago now that actually was called uh, um, something like a Christian defense of horror. Defense was the word. And I think many years later, after thinking about it more and obviously doing much more research and, and careful thinking for a book project, I wanted to make that pivot. 
um, to something that was more positive and rather than taking the de- defensive posture, but the more the celebratory posture. So I'm glad that carried through because it was a very particular um, choice that, you know, maybe most folks might not pick up on, but I'm glad, I'm glad it was obvious to you. And then as far as like, you know, the redemptive element, um, I, there are definitely books or I'm sorry, there are definitely movies in the book that, uh, do reach for that, but that's not really a staple of the horror genre, right? Usually horror ends badly <laughs> a horror movie, um, or at the no. very least it adds, but ends okay for one character with the promise that the killer's coming back right in the sequel. Mm-hmm. So I think it's rare that, um, horror movies do have a redemptive element. I try to concentrate on a number of them that do have that. But I also wanted to argue in favor and appreciate those that do just kind of make us sit with our fears and think rightly about them, um, because I think there's value in that, too. And I think that's what I love most about the book is the way it is laid out. Like there, there's a Christian author that I really love named Terry Wardle, and, and he talks about how all human beings have these six core longings. That we, we desire to have love, belonging, safety, significance, understanding, and purpose. And when you, when I looked at the chapters of your book, it felt like you were pointing out how horror movies show what happens when those things are threatened. Oh, wow. That's are, interesting. Huh? When we are afraid of losing our sense of belonging or our sense of safety or our sense of being understood that there's different horror genres that will kind of lean into those things. And it also makes for just a great read that, you know, you're like, man, I really love uh, religious horror movies. I'm going to go read that chapter. (laughs) Right. Yeah, that's wow. That's something I wish I was uh, familiar with that book before. I didn't catch that in my research. And sounds like that would have been a great one to reference. But um, yeah, it was sort of a structural way to tackle the project is to break it into subgenres. But as as you're saying, Brad, it did also allow me to provide that theological angle is this is exactly why I am going to talk about this subgenre. So yeah, religious horror or body horror or zombies. Um, again, as you mentioned earlier, Bob, it's not comprehensive. There are some sub subgenres I didn't get to in some cases it's because I just didn't feel maybe they were rich enough for that sort of mm-hmm. theological exploration. Uh, I also had a tight word count from the publisher. So that was part of it. Um, but yeah, yeah, definitely structuring it that way, you know, gave me a path to follow that ended up being incredibly rich because I knew a couple of those subgenres would pan out, but then others, it isn't until you start watching the movies, rewatching the movies and making some connections and, you know, it might be a case where, okay, it's not going to work, but, um, yeah, horror was the genre was richer than I even thought as a fan before I started this, I'd mm-hmm. say. So what I'm what I'm hearing you say is we have a sequel in the works. Keep, <laughs> keep fearing not a continuing Christian yes. appreciation of horror movies. Yeah, like like any good horror sequel, it'll have to be like a part two, right? Or something yeah, and, like and written by somebody else who's a far <laughs> like lesser author. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see what we can do about that. <laughs> so, Josh, uh, now that I've got you here and since we gave you a bottle of whiskey last time, I want to kind of reclaim some of the time that I've purchased with my whiskey and uh, sit on your your psychologist couch for a minute. I know that, you know, in the book, you talk about this, too, that people often approach you asking about horror or, or why you watch horror to give your defense of horror. And Brad, you and I have, you know, we've watched I don't know, hundreds and hundreds of movies for this podcast at this point, you know that I don't shy away from movies. And yet Josh makes a really great point in, I think it's in the introduction to the book where he talks about basically that, that horror is kind of the most elemental of all film genres, that there is just something so deep seated about fear that it's, it's kind of like the perfect cinematic, I don't know, conduit, right? It's like that or musicals. I think you say, Josh. And I'm wondering why, Brad, you can hop in here too. Like, why do you think it is that horror is such a, I don't even want to say a turnoff for people, but like, why do I react so strongly to horror in ways that, you know, I can, I can appreciate ambiguous endings. I can appreciate complex uh, points in any other genre, but when it comes to horror, I, I I'm like you, Josh, or I'm like, you know, kind of how the book is laid out. I am looking for the redemptive horror movie and they are to your point, few and far between. And I always wonder, like, 
why do I search for the most simplistic answers in horror? And I guess, Josh, like, do you see that kind of uh, resistance to the complexity when people approach this genre? I mean, it's certainly written off, right, as the schlocky genre, the, as I touched on, the exploitative genre. Um, and those things can be true. Um, you know, it's not like it's not there, but it's not, you know, definitive of the genre, I think. Uh, it's just so visceral, you mm -hmm. know, it's it's movies are it's an art form that can bypass. And I suppose music can do this, too. I mean, every art form does this to some degree, but movies in particular, I feel like bypass can bypass the logic, the logic, the reasoning, those sorts of intellectual elements and just get right to your core primal responses. Now, that's another thing that can be exploited. And I think that's when you get bad horror, right? When they're just going for that shock or just going for the easy jump scare. Mm -hmm. But the ones that work with more artistry, and that's the other thing I wanted to give a lot of time to in the book is the artistry in this genre. The ones that do that, they affect us in ways that are out of our control. You know, when we respond to even a movie that's ambiguous, we can start wrapping our mind around it in some way we want. And what we're doing there is we're gad gathering control of the film. That's that's why people like us who love movies love to go to them and, and talk about them afterwards and and just keep processing them. Right. Well, horror, the great horror, you could still do that with. But also what horror does is it bypasses all that and just gets you it just gets to you it gets into you and there's something disabling about that we lose control there's something humbling there's something about feeling powerless these are all the things that is also obviously related to fear and so i think it's just you know the obvious answer what i'm saying here is people don't like to be afraid and so this is why people <laughs> ask you you know why do you watch horror movies i'm you know i have enough anxiety in my life already Mm -hmm. That's something out here. And I think you two have even expressed that. Um, I think it was, you know, when you were talking about The Shining, right? I, maybe one of you said something along those lines. But mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's and I get that, you know, that's this isn't an argument that everyone needs to watch horror. I, yeah. I would want to be clear about that, uh, depending on, you know, your own psychological makeup, your life experiences. I'm sure there are plenty of people who have had enough of this sort of stuff or stuff close to it. They don't need to see it on the screen. Totally get that. Um, but I think that also speaks to why it is such a powerful genre is it just it just goes straight for the chest and right in there. Hmm. Well, and what you're saying has me thinking that, like, our emotions always say way more about us than they do about the thing that might be evoking it. And so, like, as we are watching horror films, it seems like the the emotions that are rising up in us, the fear, the the terror, the, um, you know, sometimes even like an anger that this is happening, the, the, the emotions that come up say so much more about us. And I think that's, you know, to point back to your chapters, like, like pointing out what does this say about me, about my fear of being alone, my fear of being uh, meaningless, you know, the all these different things. And, and man, Josh, just just looking through this book a little bit, I'm like, ah, I can see how this this is a, a genre that could be appreciated. Don't know if I'm appreciating it yet, though. <laughs> <laughs> but I, yeah, I don't know if I need all of those fears brought back to me. Totally valid. Um, you know, the other side of that is some people and I think I probably fall more into this category find that horror can be cathartic. You know, it can, um, I don't know, I tend to repress things, um, you know, especially things I don't want to think about. And mm -hmm. that's not always healthy either. Um, you know, I think we could dovetail into a whole conversation here about, I don't think that's a very Christian response to fear as well. I think, you know, if you look at the Bible, there's a reason you see these very scary things um, is so that we can confront them and deal with them. Some people might do that through counseling, therapy. Mm -hmm. uh, I think horror for other people can serve that pur purpose. It can be cathartic. If there's an anxiety you feel about parenting, let's look at something like The Babadook, which I put in my psychological horror mm -hmm. um, chapter. You know, if you have a deep anxiety about, um, you know, parenting, say, a difficult child, 
and your fear of losing your temper about that. That's something you probably like don't want to actually think about, even if it's in the back of your head. And here's a movie that is all about that anxiety expressed, you know, with a monster in a metaphorical way um, that, you know, when it brought me back to those days when I was short on sleep with little kids and, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, Mm -hmm. was afraid of raising my voice. It's like, yeah, you know, there's something cathartic about recognizing um, that that anxiety is within me and there's a way you can process that. So I think, you know, for some folks, there's, there's actually practical, almost therapeutic value to it. Josh, you, you mentioned, uh, one of the first words you said in your response was that you tend to repress things. And one of my favorite quotes from the whole book is you say that the articulation, so you're talking, let me set the stage. You're talking about Dietrich Bonhoeffer, which is uh, fun fact, the way to Bob's heart. And uh, <laughs> okay, so I'm with you. You're 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 quoting Bonhoeffer about uh, the great storm that arises on the sea and what fear does and how it kind of severs ties between us and God. And you talk about how the articulation of fear is a more Christian response than the repression of it. I thought that was a really beautiful sentiment. And you do see that all through the Bible, that people are making confession like I am afraid in this moment. And uh, you, you go on to talk about how uh, your pastor preached a really impactful sermon where he talked about being a Christian is not going to protect us from the things that are a result of a fallen world. But we have the opportunity to call those things out, not to celebrate them necessarily, but to bring them into the light. And I think that when horror is done well, it helps us bring those things into the light. I guess where I'm still struggling, Josh, is when <laughs> and and I guess it's the the movies that you don't talk about. You know, it's the ones that seem to be uh, nihilistic for nihilism's sake or to imply that there is no hope. And I think sometimes there is, you know, there's a benefit in art echoing hopelessness sometimes. Mm-hmm. But I also think that I'm still more sensitive to that being the overarching theme in a horror movie than I am in, say, any other genre. And I think it it really does kind of tap into, it's elemental, but it really does kind of get to the existential, perhaps better than any other genre. And I'm wondering, like, do you still find things worth thinking about in films like that? Or is there a point even for you where you just kind of say, "This, this has no redemptive qualities for me? Yeah. I, yeah, I certainly get there. And I'm, I'm thinking of, you know, there was the whole torture porn trend of, I don't know, it's maybe 20 years ago now. And, um, so I'm thinking of saw and hostile and, yeah. you know, I have, I did not end up seeing all of those, but I can remember this was a point where I was, you know, a daily movie reviewer for a newspaper. So your, your job was to see everything that came out. So it was a less selective position than kind of, you know, where I'm at now. So, yeah, I saw all that stuff and certainly got to a point. I think it was probably a hostile film, maybe the second one where, you know, I'm the reviewer and, you know, I'm not walking out that, you know, this, my job is to be there, but I'm definitely like, half watching the screen or, you know, tying my shoes for 10 minutes or so, Mm -hmm. you know, because (laughs) those are the, those are the movies that I found to be exactly what you're talking about. I think there can be films in this genre where there is almost a reveling in the awfulness. Um, and that's something completely different than confronting and recognizing awfulness and brokenness. Yeah. I think there's a distinction there now. If someone would write a theological uh, defense of the Saw franchise, would I be the first one to read it? Yes. (laughs) So (laughs) I'm also saying that this is this is to a degree subjective, as all arts criticism is. And and that's what I'm engaging in here. Right. This is I'm not ordained. I, you know, um, so this is this is arts criticism through a theological lens is how I would describe it. Um, And that's a subjective exercise. So. To answer your question, yes, I have those films and have had those moments, um, but I'm not going to then put a fence up around them to try to keep others out, if that sure. makes sense. Um, I mean, if they want to ask my opinion in because they're trying to be discerning, I'll definitely give them my opinion. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm I'm ready to hear that saw argument if somebody has it. <laughs> 
Well, Brad, I think we're in a really good spot right now. Uh, I've had the wits scared out of me a little bit, and I think we need to drink some whiskey. So we're going to press pause here. We'll come back and go a little bit more in depth about the way this book is laid out with Josh after our break. But what do you say you and I try three whiskeys? Let's get to it. All right, so it's time for us to drink three whiskeys. And I realize, Brad, that I've mentioned multiple times on this episode that we're drinking three whiskeys, and I have not once said what those whiskeys are. So, uh, what a surprise, great podcast host! <laughs> surprise, surprise! Yeah, the whiskey part <laughs> of film and whiskey is uh, is definitely suffering today, but we're going to make up for it by tripling the amount we typically drink. So we're and not just tripling the amount, but. These are like three really big releases, Bob. They absolutely are. So the first one we're going to be trying is Castle and Keys Small Batch Bourbon. Then we're going to try a new whiskey from Copper and Kings, which, Brad, you were just educating me about Copper and Kings. Uh, So I don't mean to make you repeat yourself, but I'm absolutely going to do that now. Uh, Tell the listeners a little bit about what Copper and Kings is and uh, what they have been in the past. Yeah, so w- the best that I can tell, Copper and Kings has been making apple brandy for quite some time now. They have three different expressions of it. They've been included as the only non-whiskey producing distiller on the Kentucky Bourbon Trail, and I think that's because they've always been planning on making their very own whiskey, mm-hmm. which they now have. We are going to be having some of their sonic-aged bourbon, Bob. There you go. We'll talk a little bit more about exactly what's in that bottle when we get to that one. Uh, but the third one is from our old friends at Bardstown Bourbon Company. This is their collaborative series where they're pairing up with Goose Island Brewery, to age some of their bourbon in old stout barrels. And they also sent us a bottle of Goose Island Stout that was finished in old Bardstown barrels. And so we won't be trying the beer because primarily this is not a beer based podcast. Also, you're, because you're not even you're not even going to drink it, Bob. No, I was just say I haven't tried it yet. So we're not I, like I literally have not gotten around to trying it yet. I've been saving it for a more special occasion than just talking to this schmo on the other end here. So (laughs) we'll try the whiskey. And I just want to say for off the bat here, thank you to Bardstown for also sending this bottle of beer. I'm really looking forward to it. I do love me some good beer, Bob, especially dark beers. I'm a big stout and porter guy. Yeah, I absolutely love pretty much all beer at this point. For a long time, I did not like darker beers. That fell off. I fell off the bandwagon a long time ago on that. And for a long time, I did not like IPAs. And now I, I they're still not my favorite, but Bob, I'll drink just about anything. That's, that's your new slogan. <laughs> Brad G, <laughs> I'll drink just about anything. All right, man, let's dive into these three expressions. Where do you want to start, Brad? Let's go ahead and start with this castle and key, mostly because I have to comment. This might be the heaviest cap that i have ever experienced on a whiskey bottle it is a hefty cork man i uh i'm very excited to dive into this bottle but getting into it was like tapping into fort knox a little bit i I think they're leaning into the the uh the titular nature of their their whiskey (laughs) yeah so like i said this is their small batch kentucky straight bourbon whiskey this was released in 2023 this is the first product from castle and key that actually comes from their distillery so they'd been sourcing for a long time this is their own distillate so this is batch number two uh brad i don't know if you care but uh bottle number twenty four thousand and some and it's aged for four years so let's go ahead and give it a try yeah, and they are, are pretty good at putting their stuff online. So if you're ever curious about each individual batch, each individual year, go check their website out. They have a lot of really good transparent information. Mm-hmm. Bob, on the nose here, I am getting – I think this is a really fascinating whiskey. I'm getting like a toasted sugar. There are some floral notes and and kind of like a baked apple feel, but but not like an apple pie. Like Like if you just were like – kind of sauteing some apples without any of the seasonings. Yeah, it's closer to being like apple peel than it is like the flesh of Mm -hmm. an apple. I really like this, man, but it definitely stays in that sort of like oakier, dustier category. Not too sweet. And then even when you get to the palate, I just took a sip. There's a nice like saline kind of underlying this. It's a it's a little bit saltier. It's got like some really great toasted oak notes. It doesn't drink like 103 proof. And I really like that about it. Like it's the alcohol is not aggressive at all. 
I think this is a really solid release, especially as the first release that's coming from their distillery. I, I think for me, the the floralness of this really sticks out. There's a lot of rose petal on the finish. It, it's really full bodied. There's a lot of spiciness. I got almost it, it transformed from like apple peel into almost like a pear. Mm. This is like really delicious stuff out of Castle and Key. And I, I think the big thing for me, this is like really unique and, and really well built. And really affordable, too. Let's also mention, like, this is a, you know, they, they're like a major player in Kentucky now on the bourbon trail. But in the scheme of things, they're a pretty small player. And so to be producing their own product, releasing it, I think this is like a $45 price point. But when you mm-hmm. take into consideration the packaging that you're also paying for, and usually yeah. you and I are not swayed by packaging, but I think this is an incredible value. Yeah, it's an incredibly gorgeous bottle of whiskey. The The shape reminds me a little bit of the Tamdu scotch that we had a little while mm. ago. Yep. I think this is a absolutely gorgeous bottle. All right, well, let's move on to the second one. And I say we tip into this Copper and Kings a little bit. So like you said, they were a producer of American brandies. Now they've moved into the world of bourbon. And this is a sourced bourbon. This is not their own distillate. But from what I can see on their press release, it's a blend of five, 10 and 15 year bourbons. Now, Brad and I were each lucky enough to get a bottle, a full bottle of this sent to our homes. And once again, the PR team is absolutely killing it with the packaging here. Yeah, it it is absolutely gorgeous. I will say this. Orange and black are just an incredible color combination. It, my my high school, you know, football team's colors were like orange, black, and white. There is something just super sharp about the way this came out. They had the butcher paper wrapped around the bottle. Mm-hmm. Everything about it. I, I was very impressed. Now, this is finished in apple brandy barrels, and it is bottled at 55.5 ABV or 111 proof. Brad, what are you picking up on the nose here? It has a, a really nice traditional nose. There's a lot of caramel and vanilla. For me, some some peanuts started coming through, almost like a peanut shell. And there's just a hint of spiciness here, but nothing overwhelming. I, I'm curious. I, I don't know if I'm getting a ton of like apple brandy on the nose, but mm. I, I really like it nonetheless. I think I'm getting more. Once again, it's that apple peel more than like a really deep uh, or bright apple. But I'm going to say it, this is also a little bit dusty and I like it a lot. Like it, it's definitely sweeter than the last one we had, at least on the nose. But I'm digging that these all have a sort of like spend a year aging in the hay in the barn kind of a thing to them. And like I am really, really digging this one, Brad. Yeah, it's it's got a lot going on for it. I, I think that flavor wise, it hits all the right notes and really is is an awesome addition to the world of whiskey. Oh, man. Oh, this is this is doing it for me, man. Yeah, dude. Incredibly. It's like peanut butter and yes. butterscotch and vanilla bean. Incredibly viscous. Yeah. And, and like with the last one, I got a little bit of saline on the very front of this, but it's more like a salted caramel and it gets this creaminess to it. It's almost like a flan, but then it finishes with some of that red apple peel again. This is incredibly complex. Tons of baking spices here. Uh, Brad, I think I may have found a new favorite whiskey from the last few weeks on this podcast. Yeah, I think that what they are producing here is really beautiful. You know, even if they're sourcing some whiskey, the juice in the bottle is really delicious, Bob. And you need to go out and get yourself some uh, Copper and Kings. All right. And the last one for the day is Bardstown Bourbon Company's collaborative series with Goose Island. Now, this is bottled at only 50% ABV or 100 proof, but it is labeled as cask strength. So, Brad, we're we're drinking (laughs) the highest proof version of this that we can get. We've had a couple stout finishes before, and I think we typically like stout finishes better than we like IPA finishes. But the tricky thing with stout finishes is like the notes are a little more muted, too. So you've really got to put some artistry into it to make the stout come through. Yeah, it it takes a lot to overcome because let's be honest, like stouts have very distinct flavors and to really master that, you have to have it in that stout barrel for just the right amount of time because it can quickly tip into way too much dark chocolate, you know, coffee bean, cacao territory. Mm -hmm. There's a really interesting note on this nose that I can't pin down yet, Brad, and it's like... 
it, it's almost like a uh, a caramel or hazelnut flavored coffee bean. But then again, I don't know why I'm getting saline on all three of these today. There's almost a I don't I don't know. It, it almost smells like a bag of potato chips a little bit to me. I don't know if that makes any sense to you at all, but it's it's like being in a really comfortable pub and, you know, you get an order of like chips and you are taken down a Guinness to go with it. Like it's all right here on this bourbon for me. Yeah, no, this is absolutely delicious. I think for me, the the cacao and dark chocolate really does come through, but there is so much vanilla and caramel to, mm-hmm. to match with that, mm-hmm. that it's, uh, dude, Bardstown makes just incredible finished whiskeys. They know what they're doing, man. This, <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's like, there's a ton of coffee on this, but you're yep. right. There's something about the mouthfeel. It's just really velvety. And yep. I think that especially with Goose Island barrels, like they're imparting a ton of flavor here. I don't have the like the info in front of me right now to see exactly how long this was in those barrels finishing, but they mm-hmm. certainly got a ton of the stout character out of those barrels. Yeah, they sure did. I once again, I said it two seconds ago. Bardstown knows what they're doing. The, this is like one of the best expressions I've ever had from them. And I think it is because it's so unique. And if you're looking for finished whiskeys, there's a lot of great finishes out there. But I do think that some of these beer finishes take it to another level as far as bending the rules as to what whiskey should be able to do. Mm -hmm. Brad, I'm so glad that we got three whiskeys that were all so different from each other. Because sometimes we try to mash up some of the things we've gotten in the mail and they just all taste like standard bourbon. None mm-hmm. of these tasted like quote unquote standard bourbon, but I think it's like all the better for it. Yeah, a hundred percent, man. These are three spectacular whiskeys, all in their own unique ways. So if you're out there and you see Castle and Key Batch Two from 2023, if you see the Copper and Kings new expression or the Bardstown Goose Island, all of them well worth your money. All right, man. What do you say we get back into our conversation with Josh Larson? Let's get to it. All right, Josh, now that Bob and I are are properly liquored up to talk about <laughs> horror, <laughs> I, I'm curious. We we kind of touched on this earlier. We we talked about the idea of like real life is hard enough. Why would I want to watch this? But uh, on a deeper level than that, I think that a, a quote that immediately jumped into my mind as we were preparing for this was my boy Clive Staples Lewis, right? And I'm sure you probably know the quote I'm going for, that there's two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall into about devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence, and the other is to believe and feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. And I I think that for me, one of the reasons I don't like horror films is because I grew up in in a church tradition that had lots and lots of missionaries. And from a very young age, I have heard stories about things that happen overseas that would put almost any horror film to shame. And so I've never had an issue with, like, believing in the spiritual world. And and I think that horror films can help us realize, hey, there's a lot more to this world than just the physical. But what do you do when you're trying to balance between those two extremes, as Lewis puts them, and, and and still watch horror, but recognize that like the real world genuinely is way scarier than, than any horror film could depict? Yeah, there's a lot there, um, you know, and and this is in, in Lewis's novel, The Screwtape Letters is kind of where this idea is explored a little bit, too. Right. This correspondence between two demons, mm-hmm. um, you know, that's what I find fascinating about the subgenre of religious horror is uh, it works in a couple of different ways. If, again, looking at um, the construct of the book. Each of these subgenres tends to explore a particular fear. What I identify with religious horror is it's exploring the fear that a spiritual realm is real. And it can mean to what you were just saying, Brad, you know, it can mean that for the person who already believes that, the person of faith, um, it's really going to push those buttons, which it sounds like it might for you. Um, For the skeptic, the person who believes that, you know, this is 
this is all we've got. What we can see is what we've got. Um, it might push them a little bit by saying, yeah, but, but maybe not. And there's something fearful about that. So it's kind of like this um, double-edged sword of a subgenre. And I think even where you are in either of those two camps, you might still respond differently. So I talk about this in the book, like religious horror has kind of, it's almost the opposite for me, Brad, from you. I haven't really, you know, had the same experiences you're describing. So maybe mm -hmm. that's it. Mm -hmm. But because I am familiar with a lot of the iconography and, you know, the references that filmmakers use in religious horror, it doesn't have that unsettling unknown aspect for me that I think probably is effective on viewers who haven't gone to church all their life. You know, some of that stuff in like, say, The Exorcist, some of the rituals in that, a lot of that language is somewhat familiar to me. Whereas if it's the first time you're hearing it, it's like, oh, what's all this spooky talk? Um, and it might work a little differently on you. So yeah, it's it's a complicated subgenre, the religious horror one. I think what where I would want to be careful to the particular experience you've had is any movies that are exploiting maybe some of those realities, especially if they're coming from, you know, outside the US. You got to be really careful there mm -hmm. that you're not um misappropriating or mischaracterizing another culture. And I mean, I'm not saying this was the case in any of these stories you heard, but like there can be religious groups and figures mm -hmm. who exploit that just as filmmakers exploit it. So yep. um, so it's tricky territory. Yeah. Well, and and talk a little bit more about that. I, I think your use of the word exploit is really important here. Like what what do you think filmmakers are exploiting and how do you, where do you draw the line between a film being provocative and a film being exploitative? Yeah, I mean, you could, you could try to rationalize it and say, and I think this is helpful. Um, did that element of content that's being discussed, did that have a thematic purpose, an aesthetic purpose, or was it, sh was it sheer purpose just, um, to be extreme, to shock, um, to get some sort of immediate response that I find exploitative. Now that of course is all subjective as well. Someone might say, mm -hmm. oh, well, I thought, you know, it connected to this, uh, in a very important way for me, I'll be honest with you. Um, the only way I can describe it is that I can, I can feel it for myself almost in the way a movie moves. It's like mm -hmm. embedded in the filmmaking. It's how the camera moves. It's how the music is used. I sometimes think of movies as, as people like it, when the movie comes out, yes, it's an artistic creation, but it, once it's going there up on the screen, it's become in a way, a living thing. And you get a vibe off that you get a set. It, it's almost like if you were in a room with a person having a conversation, you could sense a little bit of where their heart really lies. And sometimes in movies, I can get that sense and I can't, you know, I wouldn't be able to point to like, this is exactly why I think it's exploitative because of this edit or this use of lighting, but it's more about where the heart of the movie lies. And that's where I would go back to saw and just watching some of those or hostile or whatever, you know, uh, the movie's heart just felt in a pretty dark place to me mm. is what I would say. So that's a very unscientific way <laughs> to answer the question, but it's I was, like I was going to say it's, it's instinct, uh, right? Yeah. I was going to say it's uh, I know it when I see it type of situation. A little bit, a little <laughs> bit. And what I, I see might be different, right? Like from from how you see it. So you have to allow for that. Bob, I, I have tried to put this movie out of my head. So you'll have to remind me of the title. What's the movie that I hate? Uh, how can I narrow that down? Come on, there's, man. You, <laughs> there are so many. I have we're no talking idea, about man. we're talking about horror. Uh, Jake Gyllenhaal and Amy Adams. Oh, Nocturnal Animals, which not, I would not okay. even consider a horror movie, but it does depict horrific things. The reason I bring it up is that Josh, I'm sure that you have seen this film. Yeah, yeah. This is probably for me one of the most unsettling disgusting like like i could go on for a while suffice to say i could not find anything redeeming about that while i can still say having watched many many movies now 
the movie is brilliantly made. It accomplishes what it's going for. So I, I'm not like crapping on the director or anything like that. But that's a movie that I walked away from going, nope. Did not care for it myself. I think what stood out to me about that one is, you know, Tom Ford was the writer and director there. And this was his second film after he made A Single Man, which was mm-hmm. uh, just a wonderful movie with um, uh, who is uh, Colin Firth, right? Colin yes, Firth. Colin yep. Firth as an English professor um, set, I think, in the 60s, uh, grieving the the death of his partner. So. So that's kind of where I came in on Nocturnal Animals and it's like, whoa, what what happened here? I was so excited for <laughs> Tom Ford's directing career. You know, he was, of course, you know, a designer, a uh, fashion designer before that. So, so yeah, I haven't thought about Nocturnal Animals much myself either since that came out. <laughs> you know, on that note, Josh, now that we're talking about specific people, you know, we're just going to call out directors now. But oh boy. Um, no, I I want to ask, though, you know, it's it's never been an uncommon thing to try to psychoanalyze filmmakers through their work. Right. And, you know, I, I know this is a hot button topic, but one of the easiest ones ever has been Woody Allen. Right. I mean, he puts everything into his movies that he thinks. Yeah. I do wonder sometimes, though, why we don't seem to do it with horror filmmakers as much like we we seem to appreciate their craft. But we don't really psychoanalyze them so much. And I think, you know, prior to uh, this year's Bo is Afraid, Ari Aster wasn't really interrogated for the movies Hereditary and Midsommar. And I've always wondered with people like Ari Aster. And now that he's kind of put his entire uh, inner life on screen with Bo is Afraid, the the point (laughs) is not as strong as... Exactly. (laughs) But I do kind of wonder sometimes, you know, when, when filmmakers make a name on kind of plumbing the depths of the darkness of the human soul. Do you as a film critic ever just kind of sit back and think to yourself, are you okay, man? Like what's going on with you? <laughs> uh, I, no, I don't. It's it's a good question though. Um, you know, the last part, I probably don't because though I engage in auteurist theory quite a bit, you know, which is seeing the director is the author of a movie, and then that's the most important thing. Um, it's not my instinct. It's not my favorite thing to do. As I said, I tend to think of movies as their own living things separate from the directors. So so that's probably why I don't do that with horror. But I think in general, you're right. It's not done for horror directors as much as other directors. And I think it c- probably comes back to the idea of the genre not being taken as seriously, right? Mm. Like a like the serious arty directors, and I'm not saying this is true, but I think this is the perception aren't necessarily working in horror. Mm -hmm. Like you guys, even when you were talking about the shining, like you noted how Stanley Kubrick, not a horror director, like this this is really his only horror film. Um, And so I think that's probably why though I do remember, you know, by the time Midsommar came out, Ari Aster's second film, people were starting to realize that this is a filmmaker with a distinct vision, a distinct interest in similar themes. That's what, you know, an interesting thing about a tourist theory is to trace similar themes across a filmmaker's body of work. I think you could also say that that's been the case with Robert Eggers, you know, who made mm-hmm. The Witch um, and then The Lighthouse and then The Northman. I think mm-hmm. you saw critics taking an auteurist approach um, to them and again, tracing themes and, and asking some of those questions of why, why is this something that this filmmaker keeps returning to? So, so in general though, it's probably just a fact of the genre being taken less seriously overall. All right, Josh, I'm going to let you get down off the hot seat for a minute. I feel like we drank whiskey and then came back and put you really on the defensive here, but no, you're good. You're good. <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk about the way the book is laid out a little bit. And I really love, you know, you go chapter by chapter and you're kind of breaking down sh- subgenre by subgenre. But what you identify in each subgenre is a, a pretty primal fear attached to each of those subgenres. So for your, your first chapter is monster movies, and you call that the fear of our own capacity for sin. Zombies, fear of losing our individuality. And I, I really love how you lay it out and how you approach each of those fears and demonstrate that horror speaks to each of those things. And I'm wondering how you came up with that kind of framework for it. And like, at at what point did you see these as emblematic of specific primal fears? 
Yeah, that was the fun part. And that's what's, you know, I've enjoyed about doing longer form projects like this and, and like movies are prayers as well is is devising this structure. And then there's always that really scary moment where you're a couple chapters in and it's been working. And then you realize you've got, you know, nine more chapters to go. And is this really gonna <laughs> pan out? Um, so yeah, I think it probably started by realizing, you know, we did need a structure to the book. And, and this was with my editors. Um, this was a bit of a commission project actually, actually from Fuller Theological Seminary. So my my co-editors, Cutter Calloway and Elijah Davidson, we knew we needed some sort of structure for this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there were a couple of ways to go about it. You pick, say, 12 classic horror movies and write a Christian appreciation of those movies. Um, but that would be a little limited, right? You'd have only so many titles. And the idea of subgenres came up fairly early on because the genre of horror is so vast that as soon as you start thinking about this, you realize, oh my goodness, but there are ghost stories. There's body horror. There's, you know, a brand new subgenre of the last 30 years ago or, or so found footage. Mm -hmm. And so it did seem like breaking into subgenres would make it a bit more manageable, allow us to address more titles. And so then it's like, okay, but what's the what's the further justification for doing this? And here's where it had to connect theologically some way. So I kind of went back to that Think Christian post I wrote, which was about this idea of, you know, not repressing fear being uh, a better Christian response. And then asking myself, well, wh where do we see fear in the Bible? What, what are the things that are making uh, the, the figures in the Bible afraid, which is often reflecting our own fears, even mm -hmm. in this day and age. Um, and then connecting those dots to some of my favorite horror movies. Yeah. So, cause you've got to have for something like this, you've got to have the genuine passion for the titles. Um, I think to get through the project for one thing and to make it come alive on the page for the reader. So I had to go with movies that I really love and, that it's almost like a puzzle at that point. You know, you've yeah. got the different pieces. You've got favorite movies, you've got the subgenre, you've got the theological element. And then that's where this idea of, okay, so so what's really going on in zombie movies? It is, you know, I feel like this idea, the most horrifying moment in a zombie movie for me is when it's generally like a loved one has been bitten and the heroes have to watch them change. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's all about your, what's happening. They're not dying. You're not losing them. It's very distinct from that. It's something different. It's, it's that they will no longer be themselves. They're becoming mm -hmm. this automaton. And this is a very theological idea. When we talk about, um, the biblical notion of the Imago Dei, that every human being is made in the image of God. And there's a distinctiveness to that. Um, there, there is something, um, you know, spiritually significant about our individuality. It's not just that I repress things and, you know, someone else might not repress things. It's, it's that we were all individually made in an individual way. And when the zombies come, that's what you lose. That yeah. that's what goes away. And so that's just one example of, okay, well, I'm going to talk about night of the living dead because that's one of my favorite horror movies of all time. Um, I'm going to go watch train to Busan, a Korean zombie movie that I know from just a couple of years ago, people loved, I had never seen before. And lo and behold, it's not only amazing, everyone was right, <laughs> but, but it speaks exactly to this as well. It speaks to what is unique about our humanity, mm -hmm. um, in a way that worked beautifully for the book. So that's when it got really exciting, right? Is, is especially when you'd find a, a new movie and recognize, oh, this fit, this, this puzzle piece fits. This will yeah. fit nicely right here. I was going to say, Josh, first off, you, my boy's preaching over here and I'm loving it. But second off, as, you, as you're talking about zombies and the fear of losing individuality, all I could think about was like, oh, I finally understand why the ending of Shaun of the Dead is so funny then. Because that's like the perfect irony is that his best friend doesn't lose his individuality. This is just who he's <laughs> been the whole time. That's true. Like it's literally yeah. perfect comedy. Yeah. It's it's tapping into that fear and turning it on its head. 
Yeah. And part of that is like the social commentary element of Shaun of the Dead too, where, Mm -hmm. you know, maybe the main thing that movie is interested in is pointing out how, like, if we're not careful in this day and age, we can walk through life like zombies, even if we haven't been bitten. Right. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Well, Josh, while we're talking about subgenres, I know you said earlier that uh, there were a few subgenres that kind of ended up on the cutting room floor. And let me just suggest uh, when, when the second edition of this book comes out in 10 years, uh, just do a chapter and call it a 24 horror colon <laughs> the fear of filming in the widescreen format. That's, ah. that's what I would like to see. <laughs> Let's just talk about Academy ratio for 10 pages. You and might how, be on to something Jesus there. doesn't want us to do that. <laughs> <laughs> you're not, you're not a fan ever. I'm taking it. Uh, I like it a lot, actually. I just think okay. that we're getting to the point where it's like, all right, you know, we we do make wide lenses still. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's it's uh, yeah, a, a favored uh, technique for sure. Oh, man. Well, Josh, as we're kind of wrapping things up here, I, I guess I'm curious for somebody like me who can appreciate a good movie but doesn't love horror. What would be your golden standard? The movie you would recommend and say, like, this is the one to get you to appreciate horror. Love this. And uh, it came up, as a matter of fact, I think, Christian, we have a movie club. So we get together quarterly online and uh, we're going to get together in October to talk about horror. Um, And immediately one of the movie club members was like, you know, I am not so sure about horror. So could you suggest to us, um, you know, three titles and maybe make one mild, make one medium and make one spicy <laughs> for people to watch. So I'm gonna, I'll give you three mild here because um, I think that's what you're asking for. And they're very different. So you might um, not be interested in, in some of these. But for a classic, you can't go wrong with 1941's The Wolfman. This is one of the mm. universal horror pictures. They're so atmospheric. The production design in these is just gorgeous. And uh, that's an easy entry one. You know, it's an older film. It's not gory. Um, Some people might even find it silly. Uh, I find it beautiful. And, you know, that's I write about that in my monster movies chapter, as I think we mentioned about fear of our own capacity for sin. So that's an easy start. Also, there's one you've probably already seen. Jaws is a horror movie. I mean, I hate Mm -hmm. to tell you, but Jaws is a horror movie. And I write about that uh, in the creature features chapter so that one gets a little gory certainly tense but i still think it's kind of an easy entry and then maybe most people have seen this the sixth sense that is Mm -hmm. straight up a ghost story movie and it has some really freaky moments and does it have gore i'm trying to think if it has a little yeah, bit, I think. Just a yeah. little. I mean, a little if you bit. consider the girl vomiting. Yeah, you know and there's. I mean. Yeah, so I would say though that is, you know, also an easier entry point if mm-hmm. someone is just kind of thinking about watching a horror film and then also thinking about it more deeply or possibly even in these theological terms. And my final question then: While people are watching these three films. What are the questions that you would encourage them to ask themselves about their experience, about their emotions, about how they're feeling and interpreting the film? How like how would you encourage them to think about these three movies as they're watching them? Yeah, uh, great idea uh, for the Wolfman. Where does the Wolfman uh, remind me of myself? Mm-hmm. You know, th- this this sort of. Obviously not in the surface details, but the existential struggle that the movie is really concerned about. And that this, you know, this story that's been told so many times, why is it told so many times? Because it's really getting at something um, about the unsettling reality we feel about ourselves. So so why, where might I see myself in the Wolfman? Jaws, what's going on with this shark? What, why, <laughs> why is this shark behaving this way? And what might that suggest about, um, you know, we talk about this being a fallen world, a broken world. I think a lot of times we think about that in individual or human terms. How might nature have been broken itself in the fall? Mm. And then the sixth sense, um, the sixth sense, I, as I said, is a ghost story. Uh, I posit in the book that 
ghost stories explore our fear of guilt, which I think is distinct from our fear of our capacity for sin, our fear of guilt in particular. So as you're watching The Sixth Sense, um, just ask yourself, who's the who's the guilty party here? Because I think Sixth Sense has an interesting twist on um, on that question compared to most horror ghost stories in which the ghost is there to expose someone who's guilty in the living world. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Mm -hmm. um, which I think is a very powerful narrative device. The Sixth Sense, one of its points of brilliance is that it does a little something different with that trope. One of the things I love about Josh Larson, Brad, is that, he, first of all, what a nice guy, like <laughs> tru <laughs> <Yes>. truly <laughs> Midwest nice. And, you know, I've always found that my friends who are like horror movie fanatics are like the most well-adjusted people in the world. Like it's just there's the great irony of horror fans is like they seem like the nicest people. And then you you learn what they've seen with their own two eyes and you're like, oh, my gosh. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> What actually what is wrong with him? Yeah. But the great thing about Josh is that he answers every question on good faith with not one hint of irony. And when you were when you were tossing him the softball of like, what questions should you ask yourself? I'm like, oh, this is a prime opportunity for him to do a bit, you know, just <laughs> the, the wolf man. How many teeth does he have? Is he that hairy <laughs> when he is not a wolf? Like. Yeah, that's you what know, I love about him. He he yeah. really wants us to engage and love horror on its own merits. Your listeners might have been happier with the bit now that now that you say that. So. <laughs> I would say, Josh, you know what my favorite thing about Bob is that dis despite being from the Midwest, he just took a solid two minutes to throw my question under the bus. Yeah, like Midwest true, nice man. Yeah, <laughs> I was gonna say the true passive aggressive Midwest uh, nice is yeah. coming out. Yeah, I thought you were gonna say <laughs> is that he always goes for the bit. That's that's what you love about him. No, I I always go for the bit, Josh. <laughs> All right, folks, this has been Josh Larson. He is the host of Film Spotting, and he is the author of Fear Not, A Christian Appreciation of Horror. Josh, where can we find the book? I mean, it's pretty much everywhere. If um, a lot of folks will say, but I like to support an independent bookstore, and there's a great place, bookshop.org, that allows you to order online and still do that. Mm. So um, they carry it as well. So that's bookshop.org. Uh, but otherwise, yeah, it's at the big place, too. Yeah, I, I was going to say my question to authors is always this. Where can I buy the book where you get the most money? Mm, mm. <laughs> you know, um, that would involve more math than I care to do. So <laughs> I have no idea. So, so bookshop.org. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's a great place to pick up books. Aside from just buying bootleg copies out of Josh's trunk, we're, <laughs> we're going to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll get to that point. All right, we will be back on Tuesday with another regularly scheduled episode. But until then, I'm Bob Book. I'm Brad G. And we'll see you next time. <laughs>